George Zimmerman's lawyers have rested their case after a testy and dramatic day of testimony in this uh, second degree murder trial. We're standing by for a news conference by the defense after the court recesses for the day. They have not done that yet. Zimmerman uh, did not take the stand to personally explain his claim that he shot Trayvon Martin in self-defense. The judge reminded him several times that he had a right to do so. Did you now have sufficient time to discuss with your attorneys whether or not you wanted to testify in this case? Yes, ma'am. And I don't need to know what was said, but after those discussions, have you made a decision? Yes, ma'am. And what is your decision, sir? After consulting with counsel not to testify, your own. Okay, you understand that no matter what counsel says to you, it's still your decision. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I need to know your decision to not testify in this case. Yes, Your Honor. The final witness on Zimmerman's behalf with his, was his father. He testified that it was his son who was heard screaming on that 911 call made on the night Trayvon Martin was shot and killed. And he had this powerful visual today. Uh, we, we did as well. Uh, both the defense and the prosecution used a mannequin uh, during their questioning of an expert on the use of force, demonstrating how Zimmerman says he was straddled by Trayvon Martin during their scuffle. Let's bring in CNN's Martin Savage and our legal analyst, the former federal prosecutor, Sonny Hostin, and the defense attorney, Mark Nijame. Uh, Martin, first to you. Uh, right now, the jurors are not in the courtroom, but the proceeding is continuing with the judge, Deborah Nelson. They're discussing uh, the testimony earlier from uh, John Donnelly, a Vietnam War veteran. Explain what's going on right now and why this is significant. Yeah, the prosecution will, would like to see this testimony struck, essentially, that the jury would be told to ignore it, uh, basically because John Donnelly apparently had been in the courtroom uh, several days before he gave his testimony, so that's what the prosecution is contending that should not have happened if he's being called as a witness. As you point out, uh, he is a friend of George. He was a powerful witness because he was a Vietnam-era medic. He was in Vietnam. He was asked if he could identify that screaming voice in the darkness, which he did as George Zimmerman. He is the only witness, you could say, who was asked to make such an identity who would hear voices under stress, which is why he was so powerful. So that's what this hearing's about. And he clearly was emotional as well in that testimony, his eyes welling up. You know what? Let's listen in briefly to what, what this argument is all about and inside the courtroom. Had her own sort of interesting take on the evidence presented and, and her view of it. Um, and then uh, Sergeant Romando came in sort of just to bring in just the information, no substantive testimony, similar with Diane Smith. She came in and identified a lot of exhibits, so he was able to sit through that, but there was nothing I'm going to do with voice identification whatsoever. The second day, she, he heard, I guess, or at least was in the courtroom for Mr. Dyker's testimony. It was during that break that and I'll proffer that Mr. West noticed that Mr. Donnelly was in the courtroom and had him leave, but we'll proffer that if necessary. So he was able to hear at least the first half of Mr. Dyker's testimony during which he didn't say anything about anything. It was the second half, but even if he was here for that, you know her testimony to be that she heard somebody scream. She didn't listen to the 911 call. She didn't opine regarding the 911 call. So he was out of the courtroom at that point. And he's, of course, present and waiting all day to testify to acknowledge this. But just so we're clear as to the violation, we also need to be clear as to what he changed, because I contested the state's suggestion yesterday that he changed his testimony. Because I said, well, he added to it. But the that we talk about, and, and that I'll talk to you about in a moment, really speaks to the infection of that testimony. It really speaks to how a witness has changed their opinion regarding something. What he did was not change his testimony. He added to it by, for whatever reason, waiting until two or three days before trial or during trial to make the, whatever that emotional decision was he went through to actually listen to something which he listened to. But that was not a change in testimony, though it is added to it. Um, and then the question is, did the violation of the rule that obviously occurred infect that testimony? I'll suggest to you, since what he heard had nothing to do with what he eventually testified to, that it didn't. Did it prompt him to finally come to grips with the fact that he should listen to the tape? Yeah, maybe so. Maybe it did. Um, but to the substance of the effect, we then have to look to some of the cases that I presented to you. Del Monte um, 
which is a 1985 third DCA case, which interprets 616.1. So it gives us some insight because you need to make a determination whether or not the rule has been violated, and you need to look into the circumstances as to what you should do with it. And Mr. Manti was straightforward when he talked about the um, the sort of seminal case talking about this, which is the Dumas case, a 1977 Florida Supreme Court case. And basically, what that means that you need to look into is to get an identification of whether or not there's been some connivance or con con collusion between the two, and whether or not we did this in some form or fashion to just, in effect, violate not only the the geography of the rule, was he in the room, but the underlying substance of the rule. And I would suggest to you that under the Dumas case, the state has woefully failed to suggest any case law that identifies that a willful violation occurred, nor a substantive violation that may have occurred. The other case law, if I might have just a moment to find it. Uh, deals again with this court's sort of requirement to make an identification of the violation, the substance of the violation, and whether or not it's appropriate to issue any sanctions. If so, then you have the right, the least, the most significant of which, or the most severe of which, is that you can exclude the witness from testifying. Certainly, there's nothing in the way this matter occurred as to Mr. Donnelly that suggests not only was it not the defense collusion or connivance or even knowledge, um, but neither either Mr. Donnelly's, and you'll hear testimony from him in a moment, but to proffer it if the court would allow, um, when the family, he, oh, I'm sorry, we weren't calling him as a witness. He was on the witness list, but as you know from what we did call him for, specific to the voice, that we were not calling him for any other reason. There was no, nothing that we were bringing him for substantively until Saturday came and I found out that he had relevant testimony concerning voice that he was even being called as a witness, just so we're clear about that. But he was definitely on the I'm not suggesting that that takes him out, but I think that it does affect um, our presentation and what we were going to do so that the idea that he may have been around would not have even sort of been effective to us in the way we were handling our witnesses. And I think what happened was once the state um, invoked the rule and refused to allow Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Zimmerman to be here, and Shelley Zimmerman was here by herself, that she requested Mr. Donnelly to join the seat, I guess the, the row behind her. And that was just so you understand sort of how this whole thing began with Mr. Donnelly coming into office support to Ms. Zimmerman. Um, and again, since I had never met him, uh, Mr. Mr. West, I think, met him at his deposition, but we had certainly not pre-tried him as a witness, as you know, we've heard some testimony here before, because, just so you're clear, we had no intention of calling him. He just had nothing substantive to offer. So that just sort of comes in mind with this, this suggestion that we had any knowledge or connivance or collusion with the witness. So if, in fact, there was, a, and there was, a technical violation of the rule, then the question is, what is the remedy? Um, before you consider any remedy, I think that you need to find that, in fact, not only was there a technical violation, but there was some true substantive violation that, in effect, having violated the rule, he gained some knowledge that was able, able to sort of mold into his testimony before the court. And there's been no finding of that. There's been no evidence or suggestion of that. And in reality, we know what his testimony was because it was quite limited. It was limited to testimony that he created, if you will, on Saturday. Um, Mark, Mark O'Mara, the uh, defense attorney for Zimmerman case of John Donnelly, on behalf of George Zimmerman, should remain uh, as evidence, should remain, uh, be allowed uh, for the uh, jurors to consider, even though the state, the prosecution, is arguing that Mr. Donnelly violated the so-called sequestration rules by uh, watching the trial, talking about the case uh, after, uh, at least until uh, he had been excused. Uh, he had not yet been excused. 
Uh, and as a result, this debate is going on. That testimony from Donnelly was very significant, a Vietnam War veteran. He testified that it was, in fact, George Zimmerman's voice crying out for help on that 911 tape. Whether or not that will be allowed to remain as evidence, that's what they're arguing about right now. We'll continue to watch what's happening inside the courtroom. Stand by for that. Also, there was a dramatic demonstration in the courtroom earlier in the day, dueling lawyers with dummies. What did both sides accomplish? And later, the former Sanford, Florida police chief speaking out now to CNN. For the first time, he says he was a scapegoat in Trayvon Martin's shooting and the racial tensions that followed.